She has been an executive in the grocery retail industry here in the United States. She has served as a global international advisor for all things grocery retail, e-commerce, and more. It is so exciting to continue our sustainability content the month of April with Susie Munford. This woman knows sustainability, and she also really understands how innovation at grocery retail is rooted in sustainability. Welcome to the Produce Moms. This is the podcast where I talk to various people who've made an impact on the fruit and vegetable community. There are so many stories to share that will change the way you look at fresh produce. I am so thrilled to welcome you to the show today. Please say hello to our guests. Hello. Thank you. Oh my gosh, Lori. Well, as always, I'm your biggest fangirl and you you really built me up. So thank you very much. It's, it's a real honor to be here and, and get to see your face and see your smiling face. Happy to chat. It has been too long, Susie. I will tell our audience, we'll start with how you and I first met. So when I met Susie, she was with the Kroger company um, in one of her various leadership positions there. I think you had just become the group VP of Fresh when, yep, and that was when I first met you. And I'll never forget it. We were at uh, one of the VIP events for the annual wellness festival hosted by Kroger. And you were up there giving your executive remarks and you were like, look, we have one of our leading ambassadors right here in the front row, Lori Taylor with the Produce Moms. And that was one of those moments, you know, as an entrepreneur, someone who's like getting my career going, I was like, wow, it was so empowering. That was three or four years ago, maybe, but it really, that moment in particular stuck with me. And I, I think back on it, Often, you know, especially in those trenches moments, we were talking about that pre-show when you asked me like, how are things going? I'm like, well, some days great, some days not so great, but, um, you know, compliments like that can change someone's life. So thank you. Well, you're very welcome. And and thanks for remembering it. I just remember meeting you and just initially being, wow, she's putting her money where her mouth is. She's living, she's living the vision that a lot of people talk about, um, from their couch (laughs) and don't really get involved. So kudos to you, Lori, for all you've done and built. You know, the way I think about it is um, as a side hustle, as a health coach, I just try to think, listen, if I can help one person make one more healthy choice, then great. Then good on them, good on all of us. And that's really what what keeps me going. And you have touched the lives of so, so many. So it's a it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. And this is overdue. We should have done this like years ago. But, you know, timing is always providential and it always works out the way it's supposed to, because when we were putting together our sustainability content um, for this, you know, Earth Month and that we're celebrating this April, I thought, wow, who has really taught me about sustainability? And one thing that comes to mind is all the work that you've done where the innovation as it relates to technology within the grocery retail sector is a huge part of sustainability. And you know, Susie, we've never really had a dedicated episode on that topic. So we're going to dive into that. But before we do, I would love for you to share a little bit more with our guests, just your self-introduction, share a little bit more about you know your work history and all the amazing places that you've worked and all the amazing things you've done. Well, I'll give you the, the quick overview. I'll leave out you know, that I absolutely am number one fave is margaritas and guacamole. But aside from that, um, <laughs> I am CEO founder of Food Sport International. It's an international advisory that I actually started in 2009 when I was first recruited to move to Australia. Um, so without, but, but I started in grocery, look, after uh, UT, Austin, Hook'em Horns, graduated with an economics degree, which means you've got you know how to think, but you really can't, don't qualify for a job. So then I spent 10 years in the restaurant business with the startup, ended up being CEO of that company at the end of 10 years. But I was looking for more and I had opportunity to get into the grocery business first with HEB Central Market and got to become part of the HEB Central Market team. Next thing I knew, I was running all of food service and prepared foods and deli and bakery and all the super cool stuff and designing prepared food halls and trying to make really healthy, good tasting culinary food from scratch in a grocery environment every day. Super challenging. Then I promoted into HEB and continued to run all of those things. So about a decade with HEB. um, And then I started uh, moving and I was recruited to Australia. So I moved to Australia the first time. I ran a lot of fresh 
for Coles supermarkets. Coles is the homegrown grocer, 900 stores across Australia. I loved, loved, loved Australia. Uh, came back to the U.S. And I, again, I'm working under food sport. It's, and that food sport umbrella is enabling me to work on health and wellness projects and grocery projects and a little bit back in the restaurant business. Uh, once I came back, I did I worked for a number of companies. Then I was recruited back to Australia, uh, this time by the competitor of Kohl's, which is called Woolworths. So I ran all of fresh innovation uh, for Woolies, as we say, um, for a year or two, came back and I'll zip through this. But uh, when I came back, I had opportunity to go be CEO for the first time in the grocery world um, for Andronico's Community Markets. It's a beloved chain in the San Francisco Bay Area. So I loved living there and running that. It was based right in the heart of Berkeley. Uh, you know, so it was right down the street from Michael Pollan. And I actually got to have him come into the store and we toured around and talked about all things food and health and wellness and nutrition. Uh, ran that company for a couple of years until it was scooped up and purchased by Albertson Safeway. But along the way, I had met Rodney McMullen and the Kroger team, and they're awesome. And Rodney said, hey, come work with us. So I got to go to work for Kroger um, as president of QFC, our banner in Seattle. Ran that for a year and a half or so. Then I was promoted to group vice president of Fresh Food, moved to Cincinnati where I got to meet you and some other fabulous people like Colleen Linholtz, who, you know, and all the three of us, I really feel are the primary architects of Kroger's Wellness Your Way platform. So a lot of great years at Kroger. Then I was CEO again on back on the West Coast for PCC Community Markets, the largest food co-op in the United States. And I really was attracted to go and do that because it's people, planet and profit. So speaking about sustainability, you know, that's something that's just it's near and dear to my heart. I think and I think it is for many people, but people just like businesses, we're all working to find, you know, where do we plug in? How can we help, you know, as CEO of, uh, excuse me, president of Quality Food Center, you know, Kroger gave me a lot of uh, autonomy. So I was able to be the very first Kroger president and actually the first Washington state grocer to eliminate use of, of single use plastic bags. That was a big deal a few years ago. It's still a huge deal today. So Susie, you were at the helm yeah. of, of, of that grocer when they made the declaration. QFC did it before any of the other banners within the Kroger company did. Yes. Wow. It's one thing to have the idea and to, ha and to believe, have the passion, but then you've really got to, to engineer the outcome that you want. It's just like anything in life. You know, we, I, if ideas, if we could just snap our fingers and turn an idea into action, that'd be fabulous. But we, we had to engineer the outcome across all the verticals, including, by the way, even in a place like Seattle, which is a very sustainable town, but we had to take customers on the journey to help them understand because it was a change of their routine. And frankly, they needed to kind of chip in a little bit because paper bags are more expensive than plastic. But we were able to teach and train and educate and motivate. And I was really, you know, my team did it and we rallied around that cause and were able to prove that you can do it and be a big chain grocery store. So that was that was a fact. That was one of my first experiences um, in really moving from idea into action when it came to sustainability. I love your remarks too about PCC. I mean, I definitely feel like business is structured with that triple bottom line. I mean, that is obviously a structure that moves my soul since we last saw each other. Mm -hmm. um, the Produce Moms is now B Corp certified. Yes, and so yeah, awesome. I know we are currently the only influencer brand in the world that carries that certification. So really oh proud goodness. of that. But beyond that pride is just, I, I view it as I view it as really the future of consumerism. I view it as the future of, of doing business. So, um, and gosh, your, your work history has taken you literally all over the world and here domestically, like, I mean, is there a leading like grocer own... that you haven't touched, right? I mean, you either worked for them or you competed with them, all of them, you know? So it's uh, it's really amazing when we think about your thought leadership as it relates to this. And I know that um, some of your projects when you and I first met during that time at Kroger included a lot of the, I didn't realize that you were involved with the, eliminating the single-use plastic bags, but um, I know that you were always the advocate 
for how can we better lean into technology? Um, you know, the business owner, so to say, for the Okada relationship and okay. some of the other some of the other innovations. So let's talk specifically about that innovation as a sustainability pillar. Agree or disagree? I'm sure you agree. I mean, I, I threw that theme in your face. I'm like, hey, I'm going to make you talk about this. And I didn't even ask you if you agree with it. But, um, you know, when I think about you as a professional, that's what comes to mind, okay, that you view sustainability as so many things, but really innovation leads. Well, 100%. You can see I smile was just when you talk about it. And and I would single you out, Lori, as a visionary thinker, because you you see, you can see strategically the pattern, right? So, you know, if I'm going to talk about it from a corp speak, I'd say, look, our most go to market models today um, have have existed the way that we go to market with a product. And I'll just confine this to grocery and I'll confine it to the food market, the food marketplace. The way that we go to market, the way that we go from seed seed to sh- somebody's, you know, plate in their home or their fruit. You know what we call that, Susie? You can button up that language. It's seed to smile because it doesn't matter if they're oh. at the house or at the restaurant. Seed to smile. Seed yeah. to smile. Oh, my gosh. I love that. Okay. The way that we go from seed to smile today in 2023, honestly, is exact same as it was in 1950 or 1960 or 1970. And so what I mean by that is we, we have a massive need to modernize by digitizing a lot of what we do. So technology is the answer. Technology is the great unlock. So it's kind of funny because I didn't major in technology, but I've been named top disruptor. I've been named top woman in grocery because I'm evangelizing for technology. So I'll just one quick drill down on that. You tell me if I'm talking too long, but today we've got technologies with companies like SES and Magatag. Their, their tag, their brand name is Vusion, but we can put an electronic shelf label on a produce bin. So we have dynamic pricing and promotion. That's a fa- fundamental element. And that pricing and promotion helps us do what? Sell. Because if I'm going to go long, I need to sell before that product expires. And I'm cre- because otherwise it's creating waste. But if we take that ESL and we add an AI computer vision camera in the same department, then I now I have eyes on that produce bin. So all day long, I see what's working, what's not, what's selling, what's not, what needs to be replenished and how often I can see blemishes. I can, I can be, I can cull my produce better. So I'll stop there, but we can digitize the shelf. We can modernize our stores now with some very simple, really inexpensive. And by the way, sustainable little pieces of hardware, like a small camera that the new cameras run on solar, Lori. Wow. No, not even batteries. So they basically last forever. So this is so this technology you're explaining with the cameras being able to monitor the quality of the product on shelf and specifically how that relates to produce, um, that exists already, that technology, and it's in market here in the United States. It absolutely is. Wow. Uh, I know that Kroger's looking at some of it, but I was I was in a high V store. Um I think six weeks ago, for instance, and walked in and boom, they've got many pieces of this platform. So today, but I'll just bring it all back to what you talk about sustainability. We can we can have these great ideas and now technology can unlock those ideas. And when we apply modern uh, technology to a store, we are no longer doing things manually, which takes a lot of human time and also leaves us blind because we don't have data. But with all the data that we can gather from these new modern digital stores, we can have better supply chain distribution. We can have just-in-time ordering. We can have better uh, sales and production forecasting. And all of that might sound kind of not very sexy, but it is because it eliminates waste up and down the supply chain. There's less food being wasted. There's less, fewer truck loads being wasted. There's no, never again will there be an empty truck on the road, which of course is a wasted carbon footprint. So I could go on and on, but tech, it's really exciting today, I think. I mean, I, I honestly think running grocery stores today is probably the most fun it's ever been because we've got technology that helps us be better merchants, better operators. But the most important thing that I know we agree on is the sustainability piece. Absolutely. And one thing that you just said about you know having that data kind of brought me back to the early days of when I met you and you helped me see grocery retail with a wider lens. Like this is not just a place to purchase 
food items. You know, grocery retail, as much as they are food retailers, they are also data, you know, houses, they are data insight houses, they are also technology innovation hubs. And I had never really viewed it as such until we worked together on the Food as Medicine initiatives. Yeah. I mean, it's really pretty cool if you think about it. And I, I recently gave an interview um, to the Wall Street Journal and they asked, they just wanted me to talk about what's a modern grocery store look like today. And I, you know, and kind of the way I think about it, which by the way, I don't, I've never been more proud to be a grocer than in the last few years. I mean, frankly, during pandemic, I felt I was so grateful to have a way to give back and help and just to not feel like helplessly watching something. To, but today, you know, we feed people, we clothe people, we have all the essential things they might need to buy in a store, general merchandise. And of course, you look at a big company like Kroger, for instance, Kroger's what, the third now largest pharmacy chain in the U.S. So in terms of a Kroger or a store that's got a pharmacy, we can also take care of your health uh, and, and your prescriptions. So the grocery store really has become the community place. We've got your back. You know, we are your best neighbor. The, and a store that modernizes, adds adds enough of the technology Yes, it, you're collecting all the customer data, not so that you can, you know, monetize it in an evil way or something, but what merchants, because at the heart of it, I'm really, I'm a merchant. Well, as a merchant, we just want to know, we want to put the customer at the center of everything we do and make decisions that can surprise and delight them. We want to make you happy. We want you to come in shopping just for milk, eggs, bread, whatever, something for dinner, and be delighted by something new, a new local brand you had never even seen before. And then you go home a hero. And so that's what merchants like to do. So the technology enables us to be both sustainable and innovative. You know, Susie, another thing that I know you were really involved with was InFarm. Yes. And the implementation of the living produce within the produce department. So tell a little bit more about, about that and what you view the future of, of like, Tight, tightening the gap between the farm and the retailer so that consumers have that touch point at point of sale. Yeah. Um, InFarm is a terrific company. They are, I think, first and best in class of indoor agriculture that was purpose built for retail, for grocery. Um, met the founders in Berlin, Germany, brought them into the U.S. on behalf of Kroger, and we started rolling them out in the QFC grocery stores in Seattle. And that was 2018, 2018-19. Uh, um, and I'm really excited because Kroger's really picked up on that. And now Kroger's got a network of indoor farmers that they use across the country. And, and look, as an organic girl, I mean, I, I, and the brand, I love the brand too, but I'm a girl that eats organic because I, you know, I want to put healthy things in my body. I also want to be kind to the planet. And by the way, I like the farmers not to have to ingest chemicals just so they can feed me. So I love all that. And I'm an advocate, of course, of traditional farming. But the stats, the stats have existed for a long time. We don't have enough arable land to feed the population by the latest estimate is 2050. So why not take advantage of all the urbanization, all the urban land and in space that we do have? Build indoor farms that produce food year round that uses 90 percent less water. It is almost untouched by is only touched by human hands at the point of packaging and harvest. And 90% of the times now, actually, that's done robotically. So there's been no human touch of this, of your highly dense, extremely nutritious produce that you're buying when you shop for in, uh, indoor agriculture plants. So it's a lovely thing to augment the, all the traditional farming. Yeah, the CEA, Controlled Environmental Agriculture, you know, indoor farming, vertical farming. I was just at a, a conference last week, the American Food Innovate Conference. You should be oh, on me. stage there, by the way, Susie. Um, but uh, they, I, uh, I was just at that conference last week and was speaking with some of the other attendees and my colleagues. And we were like resoundingly all agreeing that the rise of CEA is one of the most just exciting innovations that we've seen in our years working in produce. And for all of us, like it was at least two decades, you know, that we've been working in, in the fresh produce industry. So let's talk a little bit about that because one of the things that I learned at the conference, you know, it's extremely expensive to start these sort of technology solutions. I mean, just speaking from CEA, I mean, you're talking 
tens of millions of dollars per acre, more per acre than traditional farming. Um, so part of sustainability is being able to fund these things. And, and, you know, the financial vitality is a huge part of sustainability with all of these technology innovations that are happening, whether it's CEA or some of the other great things that we've shared, you know, in farm, Ocado, other, other things that you've seen in your career. Um, I mean, do you feel like they're financially viable? That's so, it's so, it's just serendipitous, all the, the timing of all of our chat today. <laughs> our no, because it's super cool. Um, first of all, I'll draw a little context. It's funny. When I started my grocery career, um, I started with HEB Central Market. Can we take a moment and pause to honor the Central Market concept? Because that is like one of the coolest grocery stores in America. Love them. Yeah, I do. I still I love it. And I'm now living in Austin. I'm, this is the first time I've lived back in Texas. And God, I haven't lived in Texas in 12 years. People say my accent wouldn't didn't agree with that. But anyway, <laughs> I, I live around the corner from the OG Central Market store. So love it. Only being said, I remember when I started in the grocery industry and it was with Central Market. So I had I feel like I'm the luckiest girl in grocery. That was my upbringing in grocery. But we used to put a chalkboard out of the out at the entrance of the store that would say how many varieties of organic produce there were that day. Because organic was very nascent. It was growing. People are like, well, what, what organic people? It wasn't on anybody's radar. It's interesting because I had traveled some and I knew in Europe they've been eating organic forever. But we're typically, I'm sorry to say, we're not very, we're the slow followers of with many things in the U.S. So I sort of say, sort of liken what we're experiencing right now with indoor agriculture to a little bit of that journey that organic went through. So what I can tell you is, and you asked about funding. Um, I get a lot of outreach, as you would imagine. I had a call with a private equity firm just last week calling to talk about all the new funds that are looking to get into the indoor agriculture space. And they just wanted to get some more background on the scope of the scale of the, uh, my projections of sales and, and et cetera, et cetera. So suffice to say, here in the U.S. and not just the U.S., there is a lot of new private equity money coming in to fund these farms. Because as you said, they're initially capitally intense. But then once you built it, you built it. And you got you got to remember that it produces food 24-7 forever. There's never going to be a hailstorm or a tornado or a drought or bugs or... We have to follow the sun and transition the crop. And yeah. Well, that's right. So you have an upfront investment and then you've got an annuity that lasts really forever. And that, again, is 90% less water. It uses, it's very highly electric efficient. You know, the way that you grow indoor plants and you make them, first of all, taste great and have great texture, and you make them so nutrient dense is you're just controlling the light. The type of light and the amount puts the right stress on the seedling. And the seedling, by the way, it can be organic if you want to. Um, it's not certified organic because it wasn't growing in the ground, but it's, just, it's an organic seed. So you grow this very efficient, very um, nutritional plant with the least amount of stress on it and on the capital plant in general. The last thing I was going to say, because you mentioned Ocado, Ocado's done this in the Europe where they'll partner and bring somebody like InFarm and they'll build that into the fulfillment center. And that's a lot of the idea. I imagine that Kroger still might be thinking about that because that's how we can share land share supply chain. So we're not duplicating that. So there's no additional carbon footprint. You just build some of the farm inside the just the DC and you're set. I mean, you mentioned carbon and carbon footprint in particular, um, sequestering carbon, main, you know, being able to identify what your carbon footprint is. That was a big takeaway also that I had from this recent conference I attended that was focused on um, food innovation here in the US. So anything that you'd like to share on that topic in particular? Well, nothing's as completely specific to carbon capture, um, but tangentially, I'm working with a group of folks. Um, we are working to reimagine the supply chain, supply chain logistics, just reimagine a new go-to-market model. And, and it's very conceptual at, at this point. But imagine, so, you know, we've been joined through Kroger and there's a number of grocery chains across the country. There's a gazillion food producers across the country. And so what happens today is food is produced by the company that by its manufacturer, then that manufacturer is trucking it 
somewhere to a central distribution center or directly to a store or to that store company's DC. And then it's trucked on a different. So, you know, if I'm a, if I'm a crate of apples or a case of Cheerios, by the time I get to the shelf to be sold to a customer, that thing has been on a myriad of trucks, probably no fewer than three, no fewer than three times has that been offloaded on and off a truck as opposed to going from one point to the other. So the idea that uh, the projects that I'm working on is what if we had a shared utility network of trucks? Because the product is agnostic as to whose truck it's sitting on. It's really, you know, what we want to do is we, Kroger doesn't want to have full trucks going one way and empty coming back the other. What if we all work together and shared the trucks basically, and not just within grocery, you know, I've learned through this process that companies like Panera Bread, they've got 2,000 trucks on the road every day. And you think about UPS, you think about all these, think about all the trucks you see on the road that are specific to the company, as opposed to being routed geographically from one point to another. Yeah. Lots of opportunities for those 3PL guys that are in the, (laughs) that are growing seemingly pretty rapidly. So um, yeah. Okay. Very exciting. Well, Susie, we are going to take a brief break. When we come back, I'm going to get you on record talking about what you think the fu- the grocery store of the future looks like. And we're going to play our really fun game that we play with some of our guests where I read headlines and then you talk, you know, you get to say like what your response is to the headlines. So everyone stay with us. The Produce Moms is proud to be the first and currently only B Corp certified influencer brand in the world. What does this mean? It means we view our work as a force for good, a good for the community, a good for our employees, for all of our stakeholders and the environment. Your participation in the Produce Moms community empowers all that we do. Please send me an email if you have any feedback or suggestions for this show or the Produce Moms brand overall. I believe that together we can get more fruits and vegetables on every table and make the world a better place. All right, Susie, I promised everyone before the break, we're going to put you in the hot seat here and ask you to describe to folks what you think the future grocery store is going to look and feel like from a shopper experience. Well, I think from a shopper experience, it should look and feel like your favorite neighborhood store now, your favorite foodie store should look and feel the same because we want to run, we merchants, we want to have beautiful stores that are inviting. You walk in, you smell fresh produce, you see the beautiful flowers. The coffee bar is over there. Fresh artisanal bread is coming out. So we want to create all that. So the future of stores is we're going to maintain a beautiful brick and mortar store experience in the front. Out the back is where it's going to be super cool because it's going to have a dark store. We call it dark store picking, meaning we're going to build enough back room space that we can hold inventory in the back so that we can pick all the e-commerce orders out the back of the store. So that if you're doing curbside pickup or you're doing rapid delivery, it all gets done from that store. And if we have room in the back, we don't have to have folks shopping in the aisle today, taking stuff off the shelf for e-commerce orders, which, you know, I love it. I love those. I know I'm a huge e-commerce shopper, but when I go in the store, it is annoying how many like big, you know, commercial fulfillment is happening in conjunction with the people who are just trying to browse the aisles. That's right. A hundred percent. I'm like, and I have to catch myself. I'm like, why should I be annoyed? This is literally my business, but we're, we're going to, but, but, but it's, you know, it's fair. But so the new stores will be a store in the front, but we'll, we will purpose build, uh, build the back of the store to accommodate that. And we'll have the right technology back there, AI, computer vision, digitized so that we know what's in stock at every moment of every day. And when we know what's in stock, and we know at what time of day it sold out, that makes us better uh, procure and we have better supply chain and order management. And the better we get at all that, the more efficient we get, the more waste we eliminate. When we eliminate waste, we can reduce cost, then we can reduce prices. And call me Pollyanna, but then we we can reinvest all that money into higher paying jobs, higher paying, more purposeful work. And that's some of the work that I love doing at PCC Community Markets. But that's the future. It's a store in the front. It's a dark store in the back. And somewhere in the middle, I would say a dark kitchen. And that's where 
we can bring in a couple of really cool brands so that if you're shopping the store, you might be able to get your favorite local burger because we brought that capability inside the building. But equally, you can be down the street at your office or at your home, order food to go, and we'll marry that food with the groceries that you need. And boom, and in half an hour, you've got groceries, you've got lunch, you've got what's for dinner tonight. You've got the soccer mom, you know, treat because it's your time to bring. Yes. And you know what, too? I think overall, it's just making the the shopper a grander steward to consumer demands. As I hear you say these things, I'm like, oh, my gosh, this is everything I want from my grocery store, you know? Um, And I think, too, it comes back to that customer serving ethos that everyone in grocery retail has. Well, when we have data... We can make great decisions. The way we're running stores today is no different than we've been running them for decades. And what what I mean by that is, you know, on Monday mornings, every grocer around the country, they gather in their conference room and they look at their sales. How do we do for last week? And it takes hours to crunch all this data. Well, how do we do? Did we win? Did we lose? What was in stock? What sold out? Oh my gosh, this item was on ad. We sold out way too early in the week. Then we were out of stock. Because, But the data comes in a day or two after the game is already over. So today, when we digitize stores, we get the score, if you will, in real time. And we can make really great merchant decisions. And then we can serve you better. And that's what merchants get excited about doing. And that can also serve the farmers better. Another Absolutely. one of our critical stakeholders here at The Produce Moms is, yes. is all of our farmers and producers. So real-time data analysis will allow you to not, you know, have the opportunity cost as a merchant of like, oh, shoot, this was on ad. We sold out. We didn't have enough. Well, total bummer for not just the retail merchant, but my man, total bummer for the for the farmer that that helped you with supplying the product. No more boom to bust for the farmers. They can count on us. It's a smoother supply chain. Recently, we teamed up with our partners at Tanamara and Antel to create a wedge salad board. It was an instant success on our website, TikTok, and Instagram Reels. The star of the wedge salad board is, of course, Tanamar and Antel's Artisan Baby Iceberg. Artisan Baby Iceberg is grown to a naturally petite size, and it has the most amazing crunch with a mild yet sweet flavor. Artisan Baby Iceberg is truly one of my favorite items in the entire produce department. If it's not on shelf at your local grocer, you must request it. You will love it. Visit theproducemoms.com and search Wedge Salad Board to check out this fan favorite recipe and entertaining concept. Visit taproduce.com to learn more about Tanamara and Antle. Before we transition to our closing remarks, we're going to we're going to have a little bit of fun and we're going to read a couple headlines. So, one of our headlines that we pulled is from the Wall Street Journal. Uh, this one dates back to 2019, okay? Grocers are freshening up their produce sections to draw in more health conscious shoppers. Our question for you, is this still the case in 2023? Could this be a modern day headline? Yes. It could be. Grocers are still working at that. You know, as Kroger, we we developed what we called a store of the future with the produce set a few years ago, and I'm still super proud of it um, because we could, but many grocers are still rushing to catch up. And what that literally means, Lori, is you expanded salad wall. Think about the salad wall back in the day. Today, the salad set is probably 30% of the produce department. So you're going to see a lot more greens And you see many, many more berries year round. And then the other thing I would point your attention to is tomatoes. Oh my gosh, any size, any color, snacking, cooking, anything you want. So yes, we, that's still very true today. And I think produce, God, it never goes out of style. I love that you brought up tomatoes because I do think from, you know, just, just even the, I've been in the industry now 17 years. And when I started, it was still very much the norm 17 years ago where you had like your traditional beef steak or slicing tomatoes. And then you had your choice of a snacking tomato, usually a grape or a cherry. Very rarely were both on shelf. Very rarely did you have like your four by five slicing tomato and a tomato on the vine. And now look at that section. I mean, it's a, it's 20 foot minimum section. It seems like, you know, with all the different varieties, like you said. So I love talking about the evolution of tomatoes. And hopefully usually accompanied by an ice table or a fresh display of fresh basil, maybe some fresh Buffalo mozzarella. Yeah. It's awesome. 
All right, Susie. So carrying on with our headlines. All right. So this one is from the packer.com, which is a trade journal. And I think I know how you're going to respond to this, but we, we still have to say it out loud. Okay. Okay. Technology is tackling food waste and changing the fresh produce supply chain for the better. It absolutely is. It's making us better merchants, which means we buy better, we order better, we have better supply chain, we're kinder to farmers. We don't say one thing one day and have to change something the next. And we surprise and delight customers. And we're democratizing the access of healthy, fresh food when we bring technology in. I mean, technology makes, it's how we run business today. So this isn't necessarily a headline, but it's a really important question that I want to get your response to. How important is fresh produce and the produce department to the overall grocery retailer? It's absolutely the number one department. As produce goes, so does the entire store, so does the entire company. That has that has been and still is, I think, even more today. If you're going to win in our business, you better win in produce. Produce is the most important department in Fresh, and Fresh is the most important element of your store, period, full stop. And in our lives, right? I mean, that is, oh. we can, we can, I know you said period, full stop. Here I am offering the footnote and in life. <laughs> the whole, the whole trite adage, we are what we eat. It's true. We need to eat fresh, living, vibrant, nutritionally dense food because it feeds our good gut bacteria and our gut determines our mood and our brain health. And that's how we engage in the world. And that's how we live to be our biggest, brightest selves. I mean, I, you know, I'm an imperfect eater. There's going to be times where I want chips and guacamole. And I, I knew you were going to say chips and guacamole. Yeah. <laughs> but that's okay. But because I have a fresh diet and I eat really well, I'm able to do things like yesterday, went on a 70 mile bike ride out in the hill country of, of Austin with a bunch of folks. And so, yeah, produce, produce is the platform of my plate. It's the majority of my plate. There's produce on every meal. Besides that, it, it tastes great. And so there's, there's, why would you not say no? Why would you say no to that? You know, the four values for fresh produce that I founded the produce moms upon are fresh produce is delicious, nutritious, convenient, and affordable. And that's still today, you know, that's what I, that was what I set as like my goal, I put it on a post-it note when I published that very first blog and still today, that is our guiding light at the produce moms. Each and everything we do needs to come back to helping people understand that fruits and vegetables are truly the most delicious, nutritious, convenient, and affordable choice. Affordability, that's a whole new discussion. Also, Laura, I know you said convenient. Convenience to me also includes portable. And I'll just share, I, I travel a lot for my job. I was on a nightmare flight last week and I was like, thank God I had my organic honey crisp apple in my bag. It was at the end of the long day while everybody else is eating all that crap that they buy, the snack box. I pulled out my apple and I took a bite. And this, <laughs> this guy across the aisle, he was kind of cute, which is good because I'm still single, still single, by the way. Um, <laughs> he's like, oh my God, that looks so good. And I thought he was complimenting. I thought he was flirting with me, but he actually just wanted my apple, which, <laughs> which I thought was kind of funny anyway. But my point, it's delicious, it's nutritious, it's convenient, it's portable. And thanks to you and your teammates, you know, I think there's more produce consumption now. So good well, on thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we appreciate that. And, you know, speaking of data, we're getting ready to actually release our first impact report at the Produce Moms later this year. Um, and you're right. We have made a difference in people's lives and how they're approaching fresh produce and how they're consuming it, most importantly. You know, it's one thing to, to have people, you know, have shoppers with the intent, um, or even with the purchase, we do know, you know, and, and the spirit of the theme of today's episode, sustainability, far too much fresh produce goes to waste at the household level. So far too much. Um, so yes, we do. We know now that after surveying our audience and collecting that data that we are helping at chipping away with that at home food waste, because people are actually consuming what they buy, which is fantastic. So Gosh, Susie, it's been a wonderful, wonderful episode. Um, I certainly want to give you the opportunity for closing remarks. Before I throw the mic back to you for that, though, I want to just uh, reiterate to you how thankful I am, you know, and uh, it's it's not often, it, I wish it were more often, but it's not often that 
um, you know, when a woman's on a stage where she compliments another woman and, uh, that's how our relationship began. You know, you had, you had that spirit within you to offer me a compliment when the spotlight was on you and that forever changed my professional trajectory. It gave me a boost of confidence when I needed it the most. And, and I still carry it with me today, like I said. So, um, I'm really thankful that you could be part of this special month of content with our audience and, and be someone whose voice we can really lean on and trust as it relates to sustainability and all the innovation that's happening at grocery retail. So thank you again for being our guest. Thank you, Lori. It's very, it's a lovely remembrance. It's, um, I can flash back to the moment um, and it was very authentic and genuine. You are truly a pioneer and you have breached a new ground that no one ever has. And I know it can be challenging, but you know, I've got your back and I know there's millions of people like me. So stay in the saddle and, you know, I am happy to be of service in any way at any time. But thank you for all you're doing to help feed, help feed our families. Thank you, Susie. And everyone, you can definitely connect with Susie on LinkedIn. She shares a lot of amazing articles and insights on our LinkedIn. Susie, anywhere else folks can go to learn more about you? Well, yeah, you can find Susie Monford on LinkedIn or Food Sport on LinkedIn. Same thing. Um, we, post, we post similar types of articles. But yeah, I'm always happy to be of service um, and always happy to lend my time to support these causes because this is what matters. Don't forget to subscribe to the Produce Moms podcast on Apple, Spotify, Amazon, and any preferred podcast platform. Check out the Produce Moms on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, and YouTube. Special thanks to everyone involved with the Produce Moms podcast, my amazing team. Stay tuned till next time. The Produce Moms is always accepting new brand partners. If you have a fruit or a vegetable product or a product that has the same integrity and values of fresh produce, we want to help you. Visit theproducemoms.com and in the footer of our homepage, please click on the work with us link. We look forward to supporting you.